Professor Nelson has published eight books and a great many scholarly papers. His most recent book, The New Holy Wars, Economic Religion versus Environmental Religion and Contemporary America, was published by Penn State Press in 2010. His writings on public lands in the American West has confirmed him as the nation's leading scholar, scholarly student and critic of the U.S. Forest Service policies and practices. Welcome, Professor Nelson. To give a little more background, I went to work in the office of the Secretary of the Interior in 1975, and I stayed there till 1993. And so much of, a large part of my thinking about public lands uh, were, was formed during that period. And I may continue to study it and elaborate and refine some of my thinking. Um, but by er, the early 1980s, so we're really talking about uh, a long time of a lot of reflection, time for reflection, I had concluded that in many respects the system of federal land management in the West was dysfunctional. And uh, so I set out to write, explore why and write about it and think about it, and I've been doing that uh, ever since. And the conference in Bozeman I just came from was actually about the dysfunction of the national park system as opposed to the forest system. But, but anyway, I thought what I would do today uh, is offer some you know, a fairly big picture. I mean, in a way, I'm going to try to distill some of the core ideas of 35 years of thinking about this subject, up to, and including up to the present, with a focus especially uh, on the, uh, you know, the ideas of ecosystem management and ecology and so forth, which have come to play, uh, at least in concept, a, a very large role in contemporary uh, land management. And in the West, and also to talk about how incoherent the whole idea is. And if you have an incoherent idea, it's not that surprising that you have dysfunctional management, unless you can find some way of getting around the idea. And so far, the West does, hasn't seemed to be able to figure out how to do that. So I'm going to be uh, painting in fairly broad <laughs> brushes. Uh, and I'm a person who believes uh, that ideas make a difference. And th yeah, there's the daily politics in Washington and the West and everything, and you know, that makes a big difference too. And there are a lot of historical accidents too that are not explained by ideas. But, but there are certain core ideas and certain core forces that operate. And I think at least it helps, it doesn't provide the full explanation, but it helps to understand um, what, you know, some of these ideas in terms of thinking about what to do right now. Uh, it's said that, uh, you know, in, uh, John Maynard Keynes said that the uh, ideas of current government officials are uh, basically the ideas of academic scri scribblers of 30 years past. So we'll look at a few academic scribblers here as part of this, uh, uh, which are, who are still having an influence, however, poorly suited their ideas are. I mean, my overall theme um, for the, the, all of this is uh, that the, the federal government in Washington has never been able in 200 years to get things straight when it comes to understanding the needs of the West and adapting a system and a set of ideas. Instead, it's gravitated to certain kind of you could call them motherhood ideas or utopian ideas, uh, ideas of what it thought the West ought to be uh, and how it could be made to be that, uh, but which were frequently, uh, even to the present time remarkably, you might think we live in more sophisticated times, uh, remarkably ignorant of the actual conditions in the West uh, and uh, so uh, the, the administrative structure and the set of ideas coming out of Washington over the whole 200 year history of the federal lands has been by and large ill-suited to the actual situation of Western land management. So that, that has basically left Westerners to adapt 
I mean, they couldn't live with what Washington officially was offering them. And uh, so what did they do? I mean, the adaptations have taken various forms. I'd say, uh, you know, in the 19th century, a lot of it was just to go ahead and do what they needed to do, whether it was legal or not, and uh, defy the federal government to do anything about it, which mostly they didn't. And uh, in the 20th century, it's harder to just do something that violates, you know, it doesn't violate, but it's, uh, Maybe it does violate it, or it's outside the spirit of the laws. Uh, but Westerners have adapted again in, di in somewhat different ways uh, and to different sets of ideas that came with the ideas in the 20th century, the core ones came into place in the progressive era. And uh, they haven't, what part of our problem is they haven't really entirely gone away, even though they were failing in many respects as early as the 1950s and 60s. Um, so that's the theme, that it's a federal government that never, never knows what it's doing because most of the representatives are from the East and they're prone to these kind of, a lot of them are idealistic ideas. It's not as though they're malevolent. It's basically they don't know any better and it makes them feel good to have these ideals about how we're going to shake these wonderful institutions and achieve these wonderful results. And, and because of the extent of federal ownership in the West, they have more capacity to impose those kind of ideas on Westerners than they do on people, say, who live in Pennsylvania. Uh, but also they know a lot more about Pennsylvania than they do Wyoming. Uh, and that was especially true in the 19th century. So what, just to briefly summarize uh, how this has worked, I'm going to talk about f four utopian ideals uh, that have all been utopian. Uh, and it, it goes back to the, the, the ideal at the very beginning of the 19th century was that the government would go out, survey the land, uh, and, you know, pick areas that it thought were ripe for development, survey the land, do a plan for pretty development, and then sell off the land plots according to that plan in a way to realize the development. So, sounds good, but what happened? Squatters went out there way before they even surveyed the land. And, uh, the, you know, they, you know, people weren't willing to wait. And so then what happened? Well, then the question became what to do with the squatters. Uh, and basically, they appealed to Washington for retroactive confirmation of their title. And sometimes it took 10 years to get it, but eventually they almost always did. And uh, so they were, it was originally technically an illegal act. Uh, but Congress acquiesced in it because they weren't about to send out the U.S. Army to evict all these American farmers who were out there. Uh, and uh, so then they tried to accommodate that by providing for the Preemption Act in 1841, and that would allow you to actually survey the land. But then instead of the government planning, people could go out there and locate on the land at their own initiative and then pay the government a fee. Uh, but that didn't work either because people weren't really willing to wait till the government surveyed the land. And so finally in uh, 1862, the Homestead Act, you could call it legalized squatting. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, so they, they acquiesced, fi they finally said, okay, we can't, this original utopian ideal was utopian, we gotta do something else. But the Homestead Act was founded on a new kind of utopianism, the America of the small family farm, which is what it had worked out and been very nice in Iowa. Unfortunately, it was kind of hard to have 160 acres in Wyoming and create a small family farm. And uh, so the West had to deal with the fact that they had a Homestead Act, which was designed for the disposition, and they had various other acts too. But they all were, had a certain anti-monopoly flavor, so they had limits on the amount of land. And so, that, but in the actual circumstances of the West, these limits were unworkable. So, what did people do? Well, you know, there were a lot of phony entries and <laughs> multiple entries, and the whole system was rife with what was at the time in the East, anyway, described as fraud and abuse. 
But in, what in fact was an attempt on the part of Westerners to actually <laughs> establish a regime that, that whereby they could develop forests which needed vastly more land than 160 or 320 acres, um, or rangelands, or uh, anything else really. And uh, so, um, so that was another failed vision uh, of the small family farm in the West, even in reclamation areas, they did, that was the closest they could come because there the land was actually, if it had water, a lot more fertile, but there were a lot of problems with that too in terms of where they selected to build the dams and so forth. Um, so the, the next utopian vision uh, was a fairly sharp departure. Uh, this was the progressive era, which went roughly in American history from 1890 to 1920. And uh, it, re it represented a kind of fundamental turning point in American thinking about, really about almost everything relating to political economy and governance. And it was a rejection of many of the ideas of the 19th century. Uh, the market was increasingly seen as chaotic and unable to provide the basis for accomplishing the most important national needs. Uh, instead, uh, in the euphoria over science, which was pervasive at that time in all areas of society, uh, the idea is that we would replace private markets, uh, even private property to some extent, um, with management by technical experts in the government. They would be the overall managers. Uh, and uh, it would be utilitarian towards maximizing the use value, but, based, but it was presumed or thought that by having centralized planners and so forth, it'd be possible to, to maximize that value. And so the, the Forest Service was the epitome of that. I mean, it was created in 1905 uh, by Theodore Roosevelt, really working with Gifford Pinchot. And uh, it was, in, at least conceptually and in terms of the, the moral, literal moral enthusiasms that were generated at that time for the Forest Service uh, and other uh, progressive era institutions was in the belief that these were going to offer a real possibility for a vast step forward in the perfectibility of society. So this was a whole ethos, not just in, in the West, but the, the uh, Forest Service and then the National Park Service in 1916, and then, although it was already well past the progressive era, the BLM in 1946 was founded in this, their religion, if you want to call it, this is what their religion was. And uh, that didn't work very well either, uh, partly because the scientists seemed remarkably consistent in getting things wrong. And uh, it turned out that technical expertise wasn't so expert after all. And also these agencies didn't do much to build highly capable scientific uh, research uh, institutions within them. And so politics tended to dominate a lot of the time. And, but it would often be politics dressed up in the name of science as opposed to real science. And uh, so, I mean, some of the examples uh, Gifford Pinchot said that, you know, the nation was on a verge of a timber famine uh, in the 1910s, 1920s, and in fact we had an excess of timber. Uh, they killed all the wolves in Yellowstone according to the best, yellow, best uh, scientific advice uh, in order to make Yellowstone more attractive for deer and elk and so forth. And, um, of course, about seven, 60 years later, they were trying to reestablish the wolves based on the best scientific opinion. And uh, they had Smoky Bear and forest fighting forest fires. And this was all based on the best scientific opinion. And of course, it turned out about 30 or 40 years later that they had laid the groundwork, or partially, they contributed significantly to laying the groundwork for the vast forest fire problem that the West has been facing since the 1980s and continues to face. Um, but this is actually, you know, the, the result in significant part of the application of, the, of, of 
you know, supposedly the best trained experts from the top forestry schools like Yale Forestry School and all of these places. Uh, eventually, the American public did get cynical about all of this. And, uh, but anyway, so the, again, though, the West was left, how's it going to deal with these institutions that are based on these inspiring visions, but that don't work? And uh, so the West had to, uh, you know, again, it had to adapt. And what did it, I mean, first of all, Pinchot, among other things, had said that uh, the Forest Service would be about producing things like wood to provide for the houses of the United States. Actually, the actual result was that the private timber industry didn't want Forest Service wood on the market. So they successfully pressured the Forest Service not to offer much wood. And in fact, it did, yeah, it did not offer much wood. And instead, it be, the recreation began to grow. And the actual, and Pinchot basically all frequently said nasty things about recreation. But what did the Forest Service actually do? It actually became a kind of low-level recreation agency. And, and in another sense, the federal lands uh, except for the national parks, maybe, but uh, became kind of holding zones for some future time, at least as far as the economic, real, real economic use of the lands would go. Now, that time finally did come in the, after World War II, and of course, you know that timber harvesting rose rapidly and th until the mid early to the mid 60s, and then, you know, it re reached levels. 10 million board feet a year, whereas maybe before it had been one or two, before World War II, and then it's, it maintained that plateau, roughly speaking, with some up, uh, ups and downs uh, for about 20 years until the spotted owl. And, uh, and since then it's plummeted due to a new utopian ideal, which I'll get to. And uh, the uh, but anyway, it, the, 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 uh, uh, I mean, part of the situation was that the, the agencies themselves, they no longer really tried to enforce their expert visions on the West. And they ran into too much opposition. And it, it, it was the you know, land management that was inevitably significantly political. And the Western politicians tended in those days to have a have a sway uh, over uh, you know what what was done in the West by the federal agencies, and so you had ranchers basically acquired de facto long term tenure, even though under the Taylor Grazing Act it was supposed to be short term, and the permits were uh, supposed to be well, it was a little vague, but uh, possibly uh, generally available after say their their, their lease term or their permit term ran out. Uh, but anyway, the B, so the BLM just, re, as you all know, re, renewed them. Uh, and uh, the other thing that the West did was it started taking, letting the federal government manage the forest and the minerals and things like that, but taking a big piece of the revenue. On the minerals, it's 50%. And on the forest, it was 25%. And with all this timber harvesting going on, uh, that started to become a big chunk of money. And uh, so that was another accommodation. West didn't get the lands back or get them transferred to the West, but it did get a big piece of the action on the money they were generating. Um, and uh, um, so anyway, that was kind of the, the solution uh, the Western adaptation to the fact that they couldn't get rid of the Forest Service or the BLM um, between, say, the end of World War II and uh, the, the mid-1970s to mid-1980s. Um, so then uh, what happened was, well, then there was another utopian ideal. Uh, and it, it was the ideal of that actually the purpose of federal land management should not be intensive production. Uh, that in fact, uh, human beings were rapidly uh, destroying a lot of our most natural, important natural areas, and that these areas were important. They had essentially virtual spiritual values, although 
the nature of those spiritual values was somewhat fuzzy, but they were obviously deeply felt by a lot of people, including members of Congress like you know, Gaylord Nelson and other, quite a few others. And uh, so the whole paradigm or utopian ideal shifted uh, from the progressive idea of expertise, but to maximize value and, and human value. Progressivism was all about human benefits. Uh, and as I said, Pinchot was virtually scornful of non-human benefits. And, uh, but now this idea that, uh, that the real problem was that human beings were overextending themselves, destroying nature, and that we, some radical corrective measures were needed, and that emerged out of the 1960s in the environmental movement, and it gradually assumed more and more influence uh, in the United States as a whole, but the place where it could have the greatest influence was in the West, and particularly in the West where the public lands were located, um, because the government had the power <laughs> to make changes there because they were government lands, and at least in concept, they did belong to the government, and it could do what it, you know, ultimately do what it wanted. And, I mean, it was a long struggle over, uh, you know, two or three decades to, to shift from progressive multiple use management and that paradigm to the paradigm of ecosystem management. So the contested years were about from the mid-1960s to the mid-1990s. And by the mid-1990s, uh, the ecosystem management vision had won. Certainly as far as official government policy declarations or statements of mission or statements of purpose, but also won in many practical ways, again, in terms of the timber harvest. As you all know, they, they went from about 10 or 12 million where they've been for a number of de several decades uh, down to two three, and they've stayed there <laughs> since the you know, early 1990s. And uh, so these ideas, as I was saying, ideas are, they have practical consequences, however pie in the sky you might think intellectuals <laughs> and their ideas are. And uh, the, uh, uh, so the, and the, and the other key thing though, which radically changed the whole situation. Uh, one of the absolutely most important things in the last 30 years or 40 years uh, is the judicialization of federal land management. And uh, so environmentalists and others came in and made all kinds of arguments about, in some cases, they were actually rather cynical. Environmentalists were not great believers in economic progress, but sometimes when they went into court to stop the agencies from doing this or that, they made arguments that were actually grounded in progressive ideas, but their core goal was to stop things. And uh, it turned, even though it would have been rather difficult to stop them in Congress, it turned out to be rather easy in a very wide range of circumstances to find a federal judge who would, uh, you know, who would stop it. And sometimes it was supposedly only temporary, but temporary might turn into years, and, uh, the, uh, and a lot of times if there was years of delay, then the person just gave up, and so it was permanently stopped. And, um, so how did this happen? Well, Congress did facilitate it, although people didn't really understand what they were doing. But uh, they created two litigation handles, which proved to be extremely fertile <laughs> for uh, people who wanted to shut things down. And that, that was the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, in 19, it was a, uh, signed on, I think, New Year's Day, 1970 and then the whole set of comprehensive land use planning requirements, uh, which were included in FLIPMA, and NIFMA, and the various other kinds of legislation that went through Congress with <laughs> rapid speed when you consider our contemporary gridlock uh, in the 1970s. But it, almost all of that legislation had requirements for planning, um, Planning itself was another, it was actually part of the old progressive utopianism, uh, 
Um, and nobody really understood how the planning was going to be done, and it actually turned out to be mostly impossible for these agencies to do it. When they tried, it turned out to be rather, it, they could, were certainly capable of producing large documents <laughs> with volumes of material, uh, but to actually produce something that was laying out a vision and a plan for where the, some body of land was going to end up and how it was going to get there, they couldn't do it. I mean, the circumstances changed too fast, values were shifting, politic, different parties were winning elections. They, planning the way they were doing it was not designed for the kind of fluid environment in which it was necessarily being put in place in the American. So, what did it become? It became, you know, another giant lit litigation mill uh, and uh, shutting things down again uh, with significant success. So, but you could say, I mean, from your point of view, I don't know everybody here, but I assume that a lot of you are not enthusiastic about doing nothing on the public lands. And, uh, but it was actually in some ways, if that was your goal, you were winning. And, uh, and you were winning ultimately in the name of this utopian ideal of protecting nature uh, from what people increasingly in the, you know, elite intellectual, but also a lot of ordinary people across the country thought was the undesirable human assaults on nature that were corrupting nature. It was highly moralistic and uh, it was in no sense when it got to this kind of thinking based in science. It, and so in that sense, it, <coughs> environmentalism and uh, ecosystem management represented a, a basic departure, even though they didn't often didn't admit it, but it was a basic departure from the whole idea of expert scientific management. And um, now what, uh, uh, what about it? Okay, so by the mid-1990s, the idea of ecosystem management is showing up in all the official statements of all the federal land and natural resource agencies and a lot of other places in the federal government as well. So what does ecosystem management mean? What's an ecosystem? I mean, there's an ecosystem in my mouth. <laughs> and uh, there are ecosystems everywhere. It's a, basically a nebulous concept. Uh, nobody really knows how to say what an ecosystem is. There's no definition, you know, accepted within the, you know, the sun. What, I mean, ecology is a lot, makes a lot of scientific pretenses, but there is at least a body of people who claim they're ecological scientists. They don't know what an ecosystem is. And, uh, or how you would say this is one and this is not, or what do you do when they overlap, which inevitably they do, and there are all kinds of questions like that. Um, another problem was that this way of thinking tended to be based uh, on an idea of the so-called balance of nature, that the idea that nature tended towards a climax condition and it was relatively static, uh, and it, it might go out of equilibrium, but it would go back to the same equilibrium. And it was only because of human assaults sometime in the past that this tendency to go to equilibrium had been disrupted. Uh, and what we needed to do was to uh, restore the original situation where nature was just, you know, subject to its own forces, not being corrupted by human influence. And at least on, and again, we could particularly do this on federal lands, and we, much more than, it was going to be incredibly hard to do it on private land. And uh, so, uh, you know, we now have 100 million acres of wilderness in the United States, where the, the goal is to maintain the land according to the Wilderness Act as, quote, untrammeled by man, that is, untouched by man. It's ultimately, it's a religious idea. It's basically that nature, untouched by a human hand, is the creation. And it actually is even a throwback to pre-Darwinian thinking in significant ways, in the sense that, you know, for a thousand or more years in Christianity, it was a standard belief that the creation was 6,000 years old. God had created it, it hadn't changed since then. <laughs> sort of like the climax system in uh, ecology. 
But to go to nature was to experience God. Or not literally, which would be pantheism, but his design. And so Christianity often talked, especially Protestant Christianity, about that there were two ways of being able to experience God's directly revealed truth. One was obviously the Bible, or the book of the scriptures, as it was sometimes called, but the other one was the book of the nature, book of nature. You can find talks and even whole books written about the book of nature in, you know, in the whole, in, throughout the history of Christianity. So this was kind of a, the Wilderness Act in some ways was sort of a secularization of that. I think most environmentalists don't really understand that they're experiencing the creation, although they talk about the intense spiritual experiences that they encounter. Um, but anyway, how would you operationally define what the creation would be? Um, but, well, mainly in practice it became the environment or nature before the presence of human impacts. And that's what, you know, the Forest Service and the National Park Service and, uh, you know, started studying old pictures and trying to figure out what things were like, uh, uh, you know, maybe in the West around 1870. That was probably about the time that human impacts started to become significant. So the goal was to uh, somehow really restore the West to eight, at least its land and natural conditions to something like 1870. And needless to say, this is all, you know, it's kind of a fantasy land, to say the least. And, but it's an immensely appealing fantasy land. I mean, that's one thing, don't, I mean, when you're offering people the creation and they actually feel that way, even if they don't know why, they're going to gravitate to it. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's why we have 100 million acres of wilderness in areas in the United States right now. Um, but there was an unfortunate thing happening in, uh, uh, for the advocates of this kind of point of view, because uh, further ecological research was revealing that there was no balance of nature, there was no climax system, actually nature was a succession of <coughs> radically changed circumstances that didn't come back to the previous one, but then just went to another radically changed circumstance. And so, you know, studies in the 18, 1970s, 80s of areas where they looked at, you know, what had been the state of the forest in, um, in the year uh, 8,000 or 6,000 BC or something like that. They found, oh, well, the forest had chestnut for a thousand years. <laughs> then it turned to spruce, and uh, then it turned, you know, to a maple. I mean, it was actually the <coughs> forest from one thousand years to the next could uh, was often. I mean, this was the normal situation was changing in in uh, radical ways and not returning to anything that it had been before. So this kind of made a hash of the whole conceptual foundation for pre-European and, okay, thanks, and uh, pre-European and balance, you know, wilderness areas preserves a balance of nature. Well, what nature? Uh, well, they arbitrarily picked the nature out here for eight, oh, about 1870, but uh, if you went back to, uh, uh, you know, maybe one year 1000, it was probably very different from what it was in 1870. And then some people started pointing out that there had been a lot of Native American influence. So you may have all heard that <coughs> there have been serious scientists publishing in serious journals saying that, well, it won't do to go back to pre-European influence, we have to go back to pre-human influence, which means back to maybe 12,000. And, and, and so they have literally, you know, been advocating bringing elephants back and with the idea that elephants can evolve. Uh, I mean, this is where when you take utopianism and it kind of just goes wild, but it's actually logically consistent and uh, to take that point of view. I mean, other than the fact that it would be completely impossible to restore, uh, but it can at least, you know, people can at least enjoy talking about it. Um, so, the result has been that essentially the Forest Service and the BLM, and they don't really know what the hell they're doing. 
and uh, the uh, you know you and you guys are the playthings <laughs> with which they're trying to figure it figure it out, <laughs> but they have a hopeless game plan. And, uh, you know, if you're in the NFL, if you have a hopeless game plan, you don't win a lot of games. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, um, so, uh, and, but, the, but the people who've won are the people who want no management. And there are people, I mean, in some sense, you know, but the wilderness idea is no management. But now that idea has been extended way beyond just wilderness areas to encompass, you know, maybe half of the management, half of the forests, national forests now are in various forms of no management. And the other half are in forms of rather restricted management of all kinds. And um, so, um, and so what is it, you know, the Forest Service itself, I mean, they, you know, they published this document in, uh, uh, 2002. I'm blocking on the exact name, but and uh, uh, but it was basically about the grid, state of gridlock and paralysis in the Forest Service. And they said, you know, we can't manage under these circumstances. It was addressed to Congress. They said, look, fix the situation. If you don't fix it, we can't do anything. And to really address some of the main problems on the you know on the national forest and this kind of state of gridlock and confusion and nobody knows what ecosystem management is but it sounds wonderful as a you know as a shibboleth or something like that um, that uh, it's protecting the creation my god what could be more noble and uh, so anyway uh, but we so we've just kind of stumbled from there uh, up to the present, roughly. Now, some people are telling me, in fact, I was talking to some people at this conference in Bozeman, that even the advocates of ecosystem management are starting to see the light. And uh, they're realizing that uh, no management can be bad. <laughs> like, it can lead to these fire situations that are bad, and they're even bad from an ecosystem point of view. And that there we're, so we're in a period, I think, now, at least in, you know, kind of on the cutting edge. They're, they're claiming, and there's some evidence that this is true, that even groups like the Wilderness Society or the Sierra Club are willing to start rethinking some of these things and are willing to, um, you know, work, work, work with people, actually, to try and figure out how to manage the land. And they're also, you know, they tend, environmentalists are, they're not really, at heart, progressive believers in expertise, scientific expertise in central management. I mean, they're basically moralists. And, uh, but they do see that something needs to be done. And they, and they want to, um, to the extent they're willing to, they want to look at it in terms of decentralized instruments of management. And there are the, all these collaboration groups, but now they're even starting, to, which have been around for quite a while and haven't had much effect, uh, because they didn't really transfer the power <laughs> to the local level. Uh, but they're willing to look at new governing instruments, which would actually potentially transfer um, the, uh, you know, not just the, you know, meeting and talking a lot, but actually decision making. <laughs> And take it, and literally take it out of the hands of the uh, Forest Service and BLM. And, and there's a lot of ideas about how to do that, and no consensus at this point. But one of the ideas, which actually was one of the reasons I went to Bozeman, I've been suggesting. I had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal suggesting uh, the idea of charter par uh, charter forests or charter parks, based on the idea of charter schools. So if you looked at a central city school system in 18, 1980, it was a progressive type thing. It was consolidated power in one central city school that encompassed the entire central city um, and centralized rules and administrative appointments, a lot like the Forest Service. And uh, it was a disaster even worse than the Forest Service, because the victims in this case were poor kids and minority groups in the inner cities. Uh, 
who had some of the worst education, at least in the developed world. And, uh, but there was intense opposition uh, to changing it. And, but finally, they broke through in 1991. They approved um, the idea of a charter school. So a charter school broke out of all the progressive apparatus. No more centralized control, no more teachers unions. <laughs> Uh, a local board that could select its own administrators, in substantial operating autonomy, uh, and, uh, and real autonomy, real governance. And uh, they started small, but in the last 10 years, uh, they've gone from about 0.1% of public school students in the United States to about 5%, but they're growing very rapidly and they could easily become, you know, 20% in 10 years. In Washington, D.C. and New Orleans, they're already 50% of the school students. And so there have now been a bunch of studies, in this, and then they're coming out every day of the effectiveness of these charter schools. And there's some real turkeys, as you might expect. So you need a mechanism for getting rid of the turkeys. Uh, but among the ones that are are, you know, at the very, above being most skillful and having the best results. I mean, some people are describing it as quasi-miraculous. <laughs> They're taking student populations in the inner cities who were considered hopeless, and some of those kids are going to Harvard now. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, there's an example of where someone actually took on this kind of whole utopian progressive set of ideas and tried to transform it and is actually having some success, or a lot of success. <coughs> and so my proposal was, well, let's take a similar approach in the public lands. But it's a little more complicated, because when the case of the charter school, it's easy to say who the board of directors would represent, the parents. Who would be, who would select, and how would you select a board of directors for a charter forest? But if you could figure the answer to that, I think it would be something that would be certainly worth experimenting with. Um, so I guess that's uh, the, the um, uh, about what I have to say in terms, as I said, it was a very broad brush picture of how it looks to me. Um, I, I would say that the West itself sometimes has been its own, well, I wouldn't say its own worst enemy, but uh, I mean, I was in the Interior Department when the Sagebrush Rebellion came along, and so, uh, you know, there was a real possibility that some of the land could have been transferred, not maybe all of it or anything, but uh, when that possibility arose, and a lot of the Sagebrush re Rebels were Republicans, well, no, the Republicans said no, because we're afraid it'll cost too much money, and that the government, the federal government is feeding too much money into the West. And uh, so who's going to pay for firefighting and things like that? And basically to go to state ownership would be kind of a leap, little bit of a leap into the unknown. And so a lot of Westerners weren't willing to leap. Uh, even though rhetorically a lot of Western kind of populists had said, well, yeah, this is what we want to do, until they actually might have potentially had a chance to do it. So, uh, my view is that, uh, you know, one of the things is, I mean, I think that if the West, that the West is not locked in by Eastern politics, it's been, the current status quo has been really due to a division within the West, and, all, and a lot relating to things like money, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, and I think, you know, the West, if the West were actually to come to some, you know, broader agreement on what it wanted to do on these government-owned lands, I mean, the West has, uh, you know, they're, they're in the Senate, uh, the, the, the uh, I think it's the seven most rural counties, con uh, states in the West have 3% of the U.S. population and 14% of the votes in the Senate. And these votes are very valuable. <laughs> they could be traded for a lot of things. And, uh, and I think the West could have uh, actually made some much, you know, some very substantial changes. But uh, there's also the, you know, the issue of existing rights and ranchers. Uh, 
and how are they going to, how are you going to deal with the rancher? You know, it's the long established relationship between the BLM and the Forest Service and the rancher, which basically, you know, it's a quasi property, right, if not a real property, right? And it, how is that going to be dealt with if you make, start making real major changes? So I, I've been working with the state of Utah, which has been, uh, and I have with some of the, even the members of the governor's office there. And this has been my pitch to them is, you know, don't make populist appeals <laughs> for turning over the land or think the Supreme Court is going to do it for you. If you really want to do it, you're going to actually have to work out a rather specific, quite comprehensive, you know, a couple hundred, maybe 300 pages talking and about, you know, which lands you're talking about and what, how you want to change their status. If they were to actually transfer to state ownership, would they go to the trust lands or would they go to the state parks? Uh, what lands would be exempt, like wilderness or national parks? All these things. And how are you going to deal with existing rights um, and so forth? And what would be a timeline and how are you going to deal with firefighting? And until a western state can come forward with a set of, not just you know, vague answers as to how you, these things are going to be dealt with, but actually detailed answers. Uh, it's not, nothing much is going to happen except we're just going to stumble along. And there, there may be improvisation of collaborative groups at the local level that will somehow get more real power than they've had up till now. Um, and that could happen. So that might be a way we would decentralize without actually having to, you know, adopt a formal mechanism or law to do it. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, I, uh, this idea of developing these kind of plans, I, I believe the Arizona legislature recently, <coughs> well, within the last year or so, passed some degree of funding to do this kind of study, and Nevada has been working on it. I think there's also some interest even in Idaho, although I don't know much about the details. So that's it. Uh, that's my panoramic assessment. Uh, and. Uh, but the, I, I think it's probably going to be virtually impossible to get rid of the federal government fully, but at least in the short run. So, thank you. Chartered forests. And you explained the charter school model, but how might that, how would the charter forest and park model work? Well, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of options. I mean, the first question is how would you identify the boundaries of a charter forest, let's say? Um, you know, one option would be, for, you, you, that, and you, you would have to create a charter, they, in, the, in, in the school systems they have citywide charter school boards, which are separate from the regular education system. And so you apply to this citywide charter board to create a charter school, and you have to get permission. Now we have to have something like that. Uh, and that, so that would be a first step. Maybe it could be at the state level, or maybe at the federal level. It depends on how many people are interested in the charter for us. And so then you would put together a proposal and take it to this charter board, and you would lay out your, you know, your intentions for how you're going to elect your board of directors. You know, what, you know, just a, a broad mission statement of how, what you're going to try to achieve. I mean, in the case of a charter school, it would be something like, you know, improved test scores, improved uh, parental involvement, reduced dropout rates. I, mean, I don't think it would be that hard to come out with a set of sort of similarly fundamental objectives <coughs> for an area of national forest that didn't get into the regulation or the man, you know, the federal or the centralized imposition of exactly how you're going to do it. You would just say, this is what we're going to be striving for. And, but then they, the next thing would be, you know, charter schools don't have to have, they don't have to hire union teachers. So the equivalent of that is you don't have to hire civil servants. 
you know, on your charter forest. You know, people who've gone through the civil service system, or even you know, been hired according to the rules of the civil service system. And the charter schools could set their own salaries and bargain and negotiate with individuals about what they're going to pay them based on how much they need them and other considerations. So you're going to let your charter force do that too. And uh, they will have no obligation to continue the existing federal personnel in place. Those personnel will only be part of the charter forest if the charter forest decides that it wants them. <laughs> and uh, the uh, uh, now remember, this is not a utopia in the inner city schools. We're doing this. <laughs> I mean, the schools unions and everything fought like crazy. They lied. They cheated. <laughs> they did virtually. They published false test score results, and I mean, virtually anything you could imagine to try to prevent this from happening, but it is happening anyway. And uh, the, uh, so, okay, so then the next thing is you've got to free up your, your uh, charter force to be able to manage. So the first thing you do is exempt them from NEPA. Uh, and the second thing you do is you exempt them from any land use planning, certainly comprehensive land use planning requirements. So you basically pull them out of the judicial system. As, except to, with respect to more fundamental things like you know, fraud or you know, malfeasance or traditional things that uh, you know, even you could even in a private business you could probably sue someone about or you know, it would be breaking the law. And uh, in the case of the Endangered Species Act, I don't see getting an exemption from the Endangered Species Act. But my proposal is to shift it from Section 7 which is the Jeopardy Clause, which relates to federal agencies, to Section 9, which is the clause that relates to private property, which, or anything else, says you can't take an endangered species. And uh, the, uh, um, so then some of the key things would be, how are you going to create these in the first place? I've offered one possibility. Another possibility would be to actually more proactively pick certain boundaries through some charter board or some mechanism, not through the agencies themselves. <laughs> Maybe you could use some of their personnel and, uh, and lay out some, say, OK, we want a charter forest here. Yeah, without having anybody have come in in the first place to already propose that. And then you say, okay, we're open for uh, proposals for management regimes and how to select the board of directors and all these other things. And then the charter, you know, the charter board would go through it and pick one. And it probably would be for 10 years. And then there would be a review. And if they had failed to fulfill their promises in their charter contract, they would be, you know, they might have their contract or their charter revoked. And it would be seriously reviewed. Even if they had failed, though, if they had good reasons to explain why they failed, <laughs> and they could offer evidence they had actually been doing a good job as far as management, um, they might, it might be continued. On the other hand, if in year two it turns out that some member of the board is stealing funds, and for private use, I mean, you could revoke the charter right then. And, uh, and this has happened to, to charter schools. They're, I mean, they're, the charter schools are a mix. The key to the whole charter school thing, I, do, I describe what, all of these ideas as freedom with, a, with accountability. So you give these, you know, more, much more decentralized units a much greater freedom to operate. And, but then you have to have mechanisms of accountability. I mean, one mechanism, the parents can always, in a charter school, always go somewhere else. Um, as I've said, it's not a perfect analogy to extend it to a charter forest, but certainly people can go to another forest or another charter forest, maybe, if they don't like the way recreation is being handled. And another thing that these charter forests would have would be the freedom to set uh, user fees and maybe within some boundaries that might be nationally set, but they would offer much greater latitude than they have right now, or the Forest Service has right now. And it would be a separate decision by each charter forest. 
And then the other, another key question would be, you know, what are the requirements in terms of their fiscal outcomes? And, you know, some of them you could probably put and say, okay, we expect you to be self-sustaining. And um, the, uh, uh, but others you might say, well, you know, the <coughs> there's not much room, and it wouldn't be just charter. I mean, you know, user fees. There could be various other private fund, you know, fundraising mechanisms. There could even be, you know, private uh, voluntary groups affiliated with each charter forest that raise money, like you know, like a, a charity or a foundation or something like that, which in some cases raise very large amounts of money. Anyway, these are some of the key things that would have to be addressed, and they wouldn't necessarily have to be addressed in the same way everywhere. And it, right. um, I was uh, intrigued by your comment that uh, some of the uh, utopian idealism of, um, of the ecological sensibility is running aground of its own scientific findings. And well, it's next, I wouldn't call it scientific, it's just practical findings. Well, they, I mean, they're not, you know, the forests are burning. The results of these intense crown fire forests, you don't have to be a great scientist to see that it's pretty bad. But there is, but there is a... Yeah, there's some here's, here's, here's my question, here's my question. The ecological sensibility is very happily ensconced in places like the university, forestry schools, and in the journals, and so on, that you may see articles for example, about deep history in forests saying, you know, back then we actually had, you know, pecans growing here and it's... Yeah, I mean... But you won't see somebody writing a paper saying, you know, this whole ecological thing, if we really had means to be testing it with some of these data, uh, it, it'd be shown to have feet of clay. You know? Well, even the goals are kind of patently nonsense. But uh, do you see aside from the scientific results, do you see papers being published that are well, saying, you know, by God, maybe this whole ecological thing is actually kind of a uh, kind of a, a wrong turn? Yeah, it's another one of these utopian schemes that's not really based on the very either scientific understanding that it's actually more of a quasi-religious phenomenon, and that and not and religion is not to mean that that the religion is negative, but uh, but that it be introduces elements of faith and so forth that, <coughs> that can be good, but in this case they're having a lot of very negative results. And uh, so the, but, is, but the answer is that there are such people. But there's a paper out there that actually says the title of it is roughly something like recent scientific uh, or recent studies on a number of fronts give a serious pause for embracing the ecological paradigm as a... People have been writing that since the early 1990s. Really? Yeah, but, and very prestigious people. In fact, one of them was at this Bozeman's conference, Dan Vodka, and he's one of the premier biologists in the United States. I mean, he's now retired, but he's still pretty active. And... I don't see papers that even say, you know, wow, catastrophic fire, that's actually great for the environment. The ecosystem benefits. Yeah, I know. People, I said, in the charter school thing, people said anything. Whatever they thought could make up that would create obstacles to instituting charter schools, they said, whether it was true or not. And, uh, you know, we have to realize that in the name of science, an incredible array of garbage is passed out in the United States on an annual basis. And I mean, this is one of our problems for governance and for ordinary citizens, is how do they know? They don't have time to study the scientific papers. But scientists get caught up in these fads just as much as anybody else. And uh, the... Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that, again, that's part of the problem. But I am saying, though, that the people who are calling this into question now are not the academics, who are often the last ones to know.
And there are people like the Center for Biological Diversity, which is one of the biggest litigators in the last 10 or 15 years in Arizona. I mean, uh, hardcore. <laughs> Uh, they have recently signed up on a proposal to try to create some kind of coordinated forest restoration. Not restoration to pre-European times, but restoration to something that won't burn <laughs> and destroy the entire forest. Uh, if, and so they're talking about prescribed burning and thinning. But there are a lot of them, what they're willing now, according to some of the people I've been speaking to, they're willing to look at these uh, contracts where the Forest Service will actually, in these, especially in these highly fire-prone areas, will make a long-term contract covering a fairly substantial area, and then make the contract with a, a mill owner, and and enough and provide sufficient assurance of supply that the person is willing to either build a new mill to replace the one that went out of business 20 years ago, or to maybe upgrade an existing mill, or some things like that. But it, I don't know. I mean, it's, it wouldn't, it, it, I think there is a growing recognition that this idea of no management, which is sort of implicit in ecosystem management, that the actual consequences on the ground are not good. And whether you're a timber company or an environmental NGO, you know, looking for, you know, how to manage these lands, whether the academics can see it or not, they can. And uh, I don't know, though. I mean, you'd have to test the ground. The only way to test the ground, though, is to try to do one and then see what happens. And uh, whether you can actually build a coalition of support that cuts across, say, timber and ranchers and, and environmental groups. And it, yeah, but anyway, it, it seems as though, from what I'm hearing anyway, that uh, it might be a more real possibility, but I wouldn't necessarily count on it on myself because uh, I've seen, you know, in my many years of involvement, I've seen many, many utopias that people would would get enthusiastic about and say, oh, well, this is going to solve the obvious problems of the federal lands around us. And then they would, you know, come to nothing. I mean, the Quincy Library, if you follow this kind of stuff, is one of the more famous examples of that, about 10 or more years ago, where actually, you know, the local wilderness society representatives uh, and the timber industry and other local people came together and developed an actual plan in one of these fire prone areas in California. And uh, there was a lot of agreement on it, but I mean, at that, one of the things was that at that time the national organizations, uh, you know, rejected their locals. I mean, you actually had an internal fight within the wilderness society between the local wilderness people and the national ones. The national ones, they were still too into the idea of central control and uh, no, you know, we, we, we can achieve our objectives by what we can do at the federal level. And we don't want to transfer or let decision making go down to a f much more decentralized level because then it's out of our control. And, uh, you know, and then there's always the possibility of federal judges in you know, I don't know how you see that. I just saw that. I, I see that the, the federal ju judge just vacated the Endangered Species Agreement for wolves in I Wyoming yesterday or the day before. And uh, But that's why I'm saying if you really want to get serious about this, you've got to cut out this judicial review under NEPA. I mean, it's, as far as it actually being an improvement in decision-making capability, it's a huge detriment. The only thing that it does is it provides a, a wide array of legal handles uh, for people who want to, you know, influence or change or stop altogether uh, what's happening. And uh, so anyway, but, but I don't, yeah, I, but I, I don't know, as I say, I think, I mean, one thing is that, uh, you know, I think the West has to, uh, 
you know, there, to some extent, there's, an, uh, there's a certain sense uh, that, you know, we want to, rather than leap into some new idea, which is uh, kind of a little exotic or something like that, we'd rather restore the old system, which is, you could call the old system uh, that the federal government, I mean, the federal government pays a substantial amount of money covering it, especially things like fire, but also, you know, restore this, you know, all the payments, and you know, so the West makes out well financially, and then also restore the historic federal political dominance, uh, which prevailed up until the, let's say, mid-1970s, so that the West could have its money, and it could also significantly influence if not, not fully control, but what the federal government did, especially through its representatives in Congress. But now the judges run the whole system, it's a lot harder for Westerners to, uh, to squeeze the judges than it was for them to squeeze the bureaucrats in Washington. So how, so how, how many people are willing to try it? Oh, I One, two, <laughs> okay. What about you? You don't look like you're too enthusiastic. I'm from back east, actually, so. You're one of the. I, I don't have, I have a much smaller dog in this fight. <laughs> oh, you don't, you don't live here very permanently, or? No, 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 I, I came in from North Carolina. Oh, okay. but you're not planning to. Anyway, uh, so I laid out a lot of panoramic stuff, if any of you uh, I've written two books on this, and, uh, well, I've actually written more than that, but these are the two that I would say are most relevant to the things I've been talking about. Now, so this is called Public Lands and Private Rights, The Failure of Scientific Management. And it's from 1995, but basically much, most of what it has in there is still relevant today. You could up, get some new updated examples, and this is a somewhat more recent. Uh, it's called A Burning Issue case for abolishing the U.S. Forest Service, and uh, this one came out in 2000, and again, pretty much most of the things that are in there, well, there, you know, there are some nuances and so forth that have changed, are still fully relevant, and uh, so needless to say, I don't get invited to a lot of Forest Service <laughs> conferences, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, um, but I don't care because I have a tenured professorship, and, uh, the, and I also have a wide range of things that I work on, so if they don't want to invite me, I'll work on something else, and uh, the, now I'm even more uh, independent because uh, Yesterday morning, I got a call from the Social Security Administration, and I have delayed my uh, pension until 70, which I will be uh, in one week. And if you made a few calculations about what I was describing as my government career, you would have figured that out by now. <laughs> but anyway, so my uh, first Social Security payment is going to come in the third, we fourth Wednesday of October. And since I waited till 70 to start, it's a pretty substantial payment. And uh, so now I can ignore everybody. <laughs> Courtesy of the U.S. taxpayers. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Nelson. <laughs>